It's a blessing to be here. I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Jonah this morning. In the Old Testament, the book of Jonah, after Obadiah and before Micah, there's a little book with four chapters. While you're turning there, <clears throat> sometimes we need extra time to get to those minor prophets. <laughs> We have some prayer cards on the display table in the foyer there. If you didn't get one, would like to have one, that we have plenty back there, please take one. We also have a notebook if you would like to receive our email updates. And uh, we try not to spam people, so it's not too frequent. But if you would like to hear from us, please put your name and email back there, and we will be sure you get on the list. We have all sung, or I should ask the question, actually, I would like to start with the question. Who here has sang the song at some point in their life, Amazing Grace? Just about every hand, amen. We have all sung many times that famous hymn written by John Newton, Amazing Grace. We sang it at our wedding as well. Um, the title is for a reason. Uh, if you knew about John Newton, he was not a likely convert. He was a sailor that was very ungodly before he was saved. A slave trader seemed like the last person who would be saved someday by God's grace and even go on to become a preacher. But that's exactly what happened to John Newton by the grace of his God and our God as well. And he wrote that song, Amazing Grace. But God's word contains many examples of unlikely converts by the grace of God. There was Ruth the Moabite, Rahab the harlot, Saul the persecutor of the church, who went on to become the Apostle Paul. Well, the story of Jonah as well highlights God's amazing grace in saving some unlikely pagan sailors and also the enormous pagan city of Nineveh. As you look at this story, it really highlights the amazing grace of God that reaches out to everyone. The title of this message is Amazing Grace. But when God called Jonah to go to Nineveh, I'm sure it's a familiar story. <laughs> he didn't want to go. We might be tempted to think that we would never act like Jonah did. Well, of course, I believe the gospel is for all people, we might say. Well, in Acts 10, 34, it says it very clearly. Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Salvation is by grace alone we preach. Nobody deserves it, and that's very true. But sometimes without wanting to, we act like certain people deserve God's grace more than others. I pray that in our brief time in Jonah this morning, the Lord will help us to lift any barriers that we might have placed in our hearts or minds on, the, on our understanding of the grace of God. And may we see once again that God's grace is amazing. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful for your word. Thank you for the church, Lord. And it's a blessing to meet together as you have commanded us. I thank you for your dear people here, for each one that's present. I pray that you might stir our hearts as we consider your amazing grace, Lord, that you want to save all people. Help us to proclaim that message, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God's grace is amazing. That's the point of this message. And as we walk through Jonah a little bit here this morning, I trust that you will come to the same conclusion. The first point, there's just four points in this message. The first point is the missionary call. And we see that in verses 1 through 3 of Jonah chapter 1. <clears throat> now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found 
a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Well, as we just read in these verses, God's justice is about to fall on the wicked city of Nineveh. But he calls Jonah to be an ambassador of his amazing grace. Unfortunately, Jonah went into the opposite direction. Jonah is actually, uh, Tarshish is actually the very opposite direction that the city of Nineveh was where Jonah was. So we see right in the beginning verses of this book the tension between the greatness of God's grace that abounds and overwhelms and then the exclusivity that Jonah wanted to put on God's grace. Perhaps Jonah thought those wicked Ninevites don't deserve God's mercy. Surely not them, of all people. Well, maybe a little historical background here would help us understand why Jonah was a little reluctant to go to Nineveh. So after Solomon's death, you all know the story, the King Solomon, that Israel was divided into Israel, uh, Israel and Judah. There were many years of decline in the northern kingdom, of Israel. In Jonah's time, Israel began to recuperate a little bit. Elisha prophesied that Israel was going to defeat Syria, and King Joash did that by God's grace. Uh, Joash also defeated King Amaziah of Judah, and Joash's son Jeroboam was someone that saw Israel's borders grow to where they had never been, and Jonah was the prophet that God used in that uh, prophecy for that event. But the biggest threat to Israel's recovering greatness was the empire of Assyria. And the capital of Assyria was Nineveh. And that's where God had called Jonah to go. Well, the violence of the Assyrians was actually uh, pretty astonishing. I'd just like to read a quick quotation here from one of their kings, Ashurbanipal II. And this quotation goes, I constructed a column alongside the gate of the city, and I skinned all the princes that rebelled, and I covered the column with their skins. Some I locked up inside the column, others I impaled on the column, and others I tied to stakes around the column. I dismembered the officials, the royal officials that rebelled. Many of the captives among them I burned alive, and some I took alive gets a little worse. From some I cut off their hands, from others their noses, eyes, and fingers, and from many I gouged out their eyes. I made a column of living people, another of heads, and I tied heads to the trunks of trees throughout the city. Their young men and women I burned alive. I took 20 men alive and impaled them on stakes. The others I made die of thirst in the desert of the Euphrates. These were not uh, people that you would want for your next door neighbor, let's say, right? <laughs> the kingdom of Assyria. Their wickedness was pretty heinous. Assyria had previously been a threat to Israel, but now because of another nation that was distracting them, Assyria goes off in the other direction. So Israel is finally getting some peace. They don't have Assyria breathing down their neck. And that maybe all of these horrible atrocities are going to happen to us and to our children. But it was during this time that the missionary call came to Jonah. God is sending me to Nineveh? What if God has compassion on them and forgives them? What if they become a threat to us again? Wouldn't it be better if God just consumed them in their wrath and they would stop bothering the people of God? But the missionary call of God is really a call to compassion. And it is on those that might not be very nice. Jonah should have been motivated by God's amazing grace and not his selfish concerns. But as we read in verse 3, he fled to Tarshish, the total opposite direction. Jonah stands in contrast to Abraham, who in Genesis 18 was praying for Sodom and Gomorrah. It was interceding for wicked sinners. But Jonah, 
runs in the other direction. Well, in today's world, there's places still like Nineveh, Sodom, and Gomorrah. But you might be surprised that even in smaller communities, the sins of these big places are practiced. Violence, sex trafficking, drugs, materialism. What if God calls you to go to a hard place like Jonah? Are you willing to obey? I have a friend that I went to school with at Northland. He grew up in a Chicago suburb. And he tells that when he was a kid, you know, the neighborhood was mostly Dutch people, I guess, at that time. And well, they came over from Holland, I don't know how long ago. But over the passing of time, uh, a lot of different ethnicities moved into the neighborhood. And in this church, instead of uh, seeing that they had a, a chance to reach out to these people that were around them, they start to leave. Well, what about the value of my house? Well, the church eventually moved. <laughs> instead of reaching out to the ones that God had sent to them, they left. Well, and uh, in today's modern world, we hear so much about LGBTQ agenda, and it's Maybe easy to think, they hate us as Christians. Why should I care about them? But God cares about them, loves them, and died for them. Maybe sometimes we run when the difficult assignment comes. Will you be like Abraham, standing against the tide of sin? Or like Jonah, thinking God will call somebody else? Thank God for servants who love God enough that are willing to go to not easy places. The second point is the preaching of the wind. So there was Jonah's missionary call to this difficult place. God called Jonah. He went in the opposite direction. But God's grace was about to manifest itself in an unexpected way. Verses 4 through 8. But the, the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, o sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? And what is thy country? And of what people art thou? And Jonah responds to their question in verse 9. And he said unto them, I am in Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and dry land. Jonah's words maybe sounded empty there in verse 9. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and dry land. He feared the Lord, but not enough to obey him. I fear the Lord, he said, but I thought I could hide from him. I fear the Lord, but I don't want to follow him. It was lip service, right? Maybe some of us are guilty at times of saying things, I love God, I want to serve him, but in our hearts, it's a different story. Well, anyways, let's continue, verses 10 through 16. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought, and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up, and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore, they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah, and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. 
Jonah never preached to these sailors. He just introduced them to Jehovah, the God of heaven. It was the wind and the sea that really did the preaching. But it reached their hearts. And it seems that there was revival on this ship. But you can see God's passion for the nations. Even these pagan sailors, he cared about. And the first prayer in the book of Jonah wasn't from God's servant. It was from these pagan sailors in verse 14. Did you remember? Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, let us not perish. <laughs> the first prayer was from these rough, rude, and crude sailors. Maybe they only called on God out of desperation, but even they can become worshipers of God. Is there any group of people deep down in your heart that you might think are beyond God's reach? You think, oh, maybe they would never understand the gospel. Well, when we avoid sharing the gospel with folks like this, what does it reflect more? The Holy Spirit's inability to convert them or our own lack of faith in God and in his power to reach into hearts of stone and give them a tender heart to the things of God. I have to confess, I have struggled with this at times on the mission field and being in a community like Ikla where there's so much drunkenness and superstitions and traditions. And surely it would be easier elsewhere, Lord. These people just don't seem to be interested. But no one is beyond God's reach. And I pray that none of us would ever think that Someone around us that we know or is beyond the reach of the grace of God. The third point is the testimony of the gospel is death defeated. So chapter one, there was a finish to this chapter with a big worship service. The sailors were praying to God, but someone was missing from that service, and it was Jonah. But God prepared a fish, prepares a fish to swallow him. God was in control. Verse 17, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. God had a plan for his servant. There are no accidents or unforeseen challenges for God. Another aspect of God's grace is that he always works in love for his own. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. I just want to encourage all of us who are believers to always trust him, even when we don't understand the situations around us. God has a good plan for what he allows into your life as a believer. I remember when we adopted our kids last year in Bolivia and we had gone to the orphanage for the first time, we had to spend a week with them and we had to go every day, three day hours in the morning and three hours at night. And uh, lots of stories we could tell you after, just like it was so crazy to meet a kid. You don't meet your kids before in Bolivia or pick them. Like when you already accept them, they're yours. You don't meet them until you've already said yes or no. And so it was quite interesting to meet kids and like, I'm their papa, I'm their dad, and I don't even know you, but <laughs> that's kind of how it went. But as we went on throughout that week and um, we would take our kids to the playground, I remember at one point my son kind of held out his arms there and I grabbed, and he just jumped right into my arms. He fully trusted that I was going to catch him and hold on to him makes me think of the verse in Deuteronomy 33, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. God is there for you, and you can trust him. And if he calls you to a hard place or to do something that's beyond what you think you can do, he's going to be right there to encourage and strengthen you along the way. So in chapter 2, Jonah testifies of God's mercy here in these verses. It's almost like a bit of a psalm. And I uh, hope we never get accustomed and routine to the great privilege that prayer is, that we can talk to the creator of the universe. But let's read these verses here. Um, 
Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice, for thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depths closed me round about, the weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed, salvation is of the Lord. Well, you remember Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, Jonah's experience here in the fish was an illustration of Christ's resurrection. I'll just read this verse to you here quickly, Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus' resurrection prophesied by Jonah showed once and for all the power of the gospel over death and that it leads to eternal life. And because of Christ's death and resurrection, we have a salvation to proclaim to the Ninevehs of this world. And if we could turn quickly to Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. This is a, a picture of what it's going to be like someday. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Salvation to our God. And if we turn back to Jonah there, verse number 9 of chapter 2, he says, Salvation is of the Lord. And we're talking about God's amazing grace. But the worship of Jehovah is not complete. We see these sailors that, get to know, that come to know the Lord. Jonah gets reconciled with God. But um, God has the fish deliver the messenger in verse 10. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. And the last point that we'll consider this morning is the mercies of Jehovah. God could have called somebody else after Jonah turned his back on him, but he called Jonah a second time. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, thy great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. God in his mercy reuses the same broken and worn tools and praise God sometimes for second and third opportunities. Maybe in your life uh, you have not been faithful to what God has wanted you to do. Well, in his mercy, he still wants to use you and you are here for a reason. I know that because you're sitting there looking at me. <laughs> if God was done with you, you wouldn't be here. But he has you here because he has a job and a task for you. Time has passed, but God's love for Nineveh has not passed. I love the verse in 2 Peter chapter 3 where we read, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some man count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Finally, Jonah obeys God in verse 3. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. He finally obeyed the Lord and went and told them the message of repentance. Um, Pastor Donnelly was talking about the Great Commission before the message uh, where our Lord has told us to go into all the world and preach 
the gospel. So often we talk about the Great Commission, we sing about the Great Commission, we think about the Great Commission, we give a lot of lip service about the Great Commission, but we need God's grace to be doers of the word, where it says in James 1, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. God has a part for each one of us in reaching out to the lost around us. Maybe it's not vocational missionary, but there's lost people around you that you might be the only Christian they know, the only person that can share with them the gospel. Let us be doers of the word. Well, we can read here a few more verses in chapter 3. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of, of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he, he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. The urgent repentance of verses 7 and 8 is motivated by God's mercy in verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn away and repent? I think we just have to look at this story and say, isn't God's grace amazing? These people in Nineveh were not likely people to believe in God and to repent and turn from their sin. But God's grace is amazing. And we'll never know who God is going to reach. Psalm 117, there's a couple verses here I would like to read. Oh, praise him. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people, for his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. God does not accept persons. He receives all those who come to him in faith and repentance. This includes fanatics of other religions, rapists, thieves, murderers. God's grace reaches to them. It also includes people in neighborhoods where we wouldn't want to live. It includes people that smell bad. That is one of the challenges of missions, actually. <laughs> the smells. Uh, it includes people that come from unpleasant backgrounds. Jesus died for all of these. Will we be faithful in sharing the message of God's amazing grace with others? These violent pagans obeyed the little revelation that they had and turned to the Lord. The truth is all of us need salvation. And perhaps you're here today and you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior. God wants to save you from your sin and to give you new life in Christ. And just as he doesn't, wouldn't have spared the Ninevites if they didn't believe, he won't spare anyone from the consequences of sin if they choose not to believe. Today is a day of salvation. But the big takeaway from the story of Jonah is that salvation is of the Lord. God wants to use us to reach the Ninevehs of this country and the world. Are you willing to go wherever he might lead you and to do whatever he might call you to do. God's grace truly is amazing. And I hope that it will tear down any limitations in our understanding of God's desire to save all. I pray that there will be more inhabitants of the Ninevehs of this world where God will use us to reach, singing the praises of the Lamb in that choir that we read about in Revelation 7. Just by way of closing, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, 
according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we give you praise for your amazing grace. All we can do is say thank you that your grace has reached even us. And Lord, your word clearly tells us that you have a desire for all people to be saved. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to show love and compassion on all people, regardless of anything in their background. Help us to understand that you truly love and want to save all. Thank you, Lord, for your great love. It surely is an encouragement to us as we think about it. I pray that you would help us to respond in obedience and being faithful with sharing the message of your love. In Jesus' name, amen.